Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to have you with us and a very warm welcome to all of you for yet another edition of IMA's Leader Speak program. This is indeed a very special program because we are honored to have Dr. K. Radhakrishnan with us today, a Padma Bhushan, an Indian space scientist, a former head of ISRO. He was also the chairman of Space Commission and Secretary Department of Space, a technocrat par excellence, and a dynamic and result-oriented manager, an astute institution builder, an able and dilig dil diligent administrator, an inspiring leader, and I could just carry on. There is so much that can be said about Dr. Radhakrishnan. Delighted to have you with us, sir. And without too much ado, let me hand over the uh, conversation to Mr. Sanjay Kiloska, President Aima, who will take it further from here. Once again, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to have you in uh, yet another session of uh, IMR's Leader Speak uh, program. As Rekha mentioned, uh, we are privileged to have Dr. K. Radhakrishnan, uh, former chairman of ISRO under whose leadership India successfully placed a spacecraft in Mars's orbit. He has played a key role in developing India's space vehicles and satellite capabilities. He is currently the chairman of the board of IIT Kanpur and the chairman of the standing committee of the IIT Council. A versatile man, I understand he is an accomplished Kathakali as well as Carnatic music performer. Uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, uh, many thanks for agreeing to do this session for Raima. It's an honor and a great pleasure to have you with us and a very warm welcome to you as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening. As usual, uh, we have a large audience. Uh, so I'm very happy that uh, we have such a distinguished guest with us. Uh, a new space race is on and India is a contender. With Chandrayaan and Mangalyaan, India has joined an exclusive club of space exploring nations. Now, India is preparing for manned space flights from 2022 onwards. And to keep up with India, Pakistan too wants to send a man in space in 2022, albeit with China's help. Doing well in the space race is not just a source of international prestige, it's also a source of great economic and geopolitical strength. In today's world, one who has the power in the sky will also have the power on land. The new space race is not just between governments. Profit-seeking private companies are a big part of the competition for space traffic and monetization of celestial real estate. Space has become a billionaire's playground with Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson proving that they can do it smarter and cheaper. ISRO has monetized the spare capacity of its rockets for many years, and now there is a plan to let Indian companies also have a piece of the action in the space business. I believe we are in for exciting developments in the sky. And who better than Dr. Radhakrishnan to tell us about India's opportunities and challenges in the new space age. So over to you, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Thank you very much, Sanjay, for the nice overview and Rekha Sethi for the nice introduction and all the distinguished guests who are present here. I welcome all of you, space experts too, in this group. I'm sure they will contribute to the discussion. When we talk about space sector, the global space sector, which is quite old, 60 years old, I should say, and we started calling in 1957 the space as modern space age. But today we are in a new space age. It's a 60 years of history, but in the last two years, phenomenal things have been happening in space. And last two months, I should just flag three important events. One is what happened in May. Two astronauts of NASA 
were flown in a commercial spacecraft. Successfully, they got into space station, they are there. And that is done by SpaceX of Elon Musk. May, June 2020, we had the government of India announcing a major restructuring program for the space sector. We will come to the details of that later. There are several new entrants into the space. There are almost 72 government space agencies today as against the two that started the program in 1957. And one of the latest entrant, UAE, went on to the moon, Mars first. And their HOPE mission is ready to be launched next week. This represents what has been happening in this field over the last few years. I have three slides just to talk about the evolution over the last 60 years of the global space sector and how we evolved in India, where are we now? And what is that in store in the new space age for those who want to do science, for those who want to exploit the resources in the cell bodies, for those who want to run an enterprise, for those who want to do engineering, and for those who want to get engaged with the society and the large market around. Can I have the first slide of the presentation? I will just cover these three areas, the evolving global space sector and the dawn of the new space age, turning points in India's space center and the portfolios of the new space age. Can I have the next one? From the bipolar world to the multipolar world, that has been a major change, 72 space agencies. It started with competition, one-upmanship, but today there is a good amount of cooperation and there are several joint space missions conducted successfully. And today there is a global space exploration roadmap prepared by 15 space agencies. What is the plan to explore moon, to explore Mars, and collectively how we can get in there? And as I say such, there are several new entrants and they are starting at the frontiers of space. And that's a good thing to see. We have a strong and successful space industry in the world today, especially in US and in Europe. A dozen of them, like Boeing, Lockheed Martins, etc. And there are rapidly increasing non-state space actors. There are 5,000 and odd firms who are into downstream services. There are almost 65 government agencies who have a stake in running satellite systems. And at least a dozen of them who have the ability to launch satellites. And the Satellite Industry Association has brought out what is the space economy globally today? Current number is 366 billion US dollar. An important point is this has been growing almost at the rate of 5% CAGR. It's expected to grow at the same rate. But if you look into the detail of this 366 billion US dollar, it is very interesting to see the commercial ground equipment and the space-based downstream services will take almost 70% of it. The launch industry and the satellite manufacturing takes just 5%. And nearly 25% is contributed by the government budgets and the commercial human space flight. This is an indicator of where the business is the commercial ground equipment and the space-based services. Now, if you look at the satellites which are in the orbit today, there are 2,700 operating satellites. And there is a good 
spread there. 550 are in the geostationary orbits, 36,000 kilometer above the equator, mostly doing the communication and meteorology. The next number is a recent trend. 1,920 satellites are in the low Earth orbit. The technology has enabled the reduction of the size of the satellite, the cost of the satellite, and probably improved performance. And the space operators today talk about constellation of satellites. It has got its own advantage. And one new thing that's happening, we talk about the Industrial Revolution 4.0, the exponential advances in technology that is supplementing and complementing the space systems. It's also competing with the space systems. 5G, for example, is a case in point. When you have 72 government space agencies and several actors in the field, space governance become an important issue. This started in the bipolar world with the UN Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. There are several intergovernmental, interagency operators like Intelsat, etc. There are voluntary organizations, there are NGO bodies and those who deal with science. And the recent trend is space has become a fourth dimension of the military activity. There is a space force already in US. And if you look at the NASA budget and their budget for the defense activities, it's almost equal 20 billion US dollar each. When you have space as part of your activities and the strategic activities, cyber threats are expected to be there. One has to worry about it. So when so many satellites are in the orbit, there are so many small parts going around at high velocity, debris collision of the active satellite is an issue and which is being studied. There are also guidelines, etc., coming into this picture. Regulatory regimes are there at the moment. One has to see how to get through this. And there are treaties which were actively done in the early days, but there is a revisit of the treaty and the legal policy framework. The last point was touched nicely by Sanjay. The beauty is these new protagonists of space, they have put their own money, 100 million US dollar by Elon Musk and 1 billion US dollar by Jeff Bezos. And in 2018, we saw that Falcon Heavy vehicle going with a Tesla and it was fired towards Mars. And recently they moved the astronauts into International Space Station. It's a paradigm change. For the last 10 years, post-shuttle era, US could not put the astronauts into ISS through their own vehicle. But now it has happened that through a commercial, a private, an individual. He is on a lunar lander, and it is going to be used by NASA for their next moon landing program expected in 2024. And when this last one happens, we say that new space age has come and there are several startups now globally and in India. Next slide. ISRO was a startup in the 1960s, if you look at it. There was passion, there was a national vision, aspirations, dreams, inspiring leadership, and we had thousands of youngsters who came from the colleges in the country. I see Prahlad, we joined in 1971, sat in the same room, and he went to DRDO, I stayed with ISRO. But what happened subsequently in ISRO is history. And today, ISRO has a strategy, an evolving strategy, and we wanted to make a difference this country through space applications, through self-reliance for making the satellites launching the The most important point is we believe in ISRO that we should partnership industry, both public and private, leveraging on their abilities. And this process started and today we have 150 of them, large, small, and they make systems for satellites and launch vehicles. 
user oriented space applications they were part of it they had a say in the running the system and they were also there to define what satellite we should make and several applications came up and we had the launch capability what i have shown in the white background there are those part of the initial vision of dr vikram sarabhai and professor sadish thawan and as our capability increased as the national aspiration went up as world changed india automatically got into the moon mission chandrayaan mars orbiter and gagarya on the top of it i have shown how the organization evolved as a startup at the physical research laboratory for various reasons in 1972 after sarabhai departed us we had a new structure the space commission department of space isro a triad it's a unique organizational structure we also inducted national remote sensing agency to integrate the remote sensing application and this was formed the semiconductor limited was brought in from electronics to space and the recent nsil and more importantly the significant and historic structural reform that took place the last two months and this is being executed at the moment so we are opening the door in this country through the structural reforms for a new era the question is what is in store for us and who could get in where we could go now before we get into that i want just to say india has a prominent place in the world in the field of space us russia european space agency japan china india this is the order if you look at nasa they spend 20 billion us dollar per year we spend almost 1.25 billion us dollar per year it has been a low cost program a focus program and a program where next slide please yeah these are the portfolios of the new space age which i mentioned if you are looking at the exciting science yes, space exploration robotic exploration and human based exploration of the solar system and universe where is life astrobiology is an area understanding the space environment the cosmic hazards that will also have impact on the interplanetary missions these are all part of that dimension a new dimension which was again mentioned by sanjay moon mars asteroids have resources which could be harnessed we also need to worry when we look at helium 3 from moon there has to be a downstream processes on earth we should be ready for that the time frame that we talk about for this may be 50 years 100 years but thinking has to go things have to be developed solar power using satellite platforms platform in the space it's a subject which is being discussed and many people are working on it this could come become a reality habitat in space i just want to say there is one country which has said in 100 years from now we will have a township in mars it's an aspiration a dream but that is one direction even when we get into moon or mars and look for the resources we have to have long life endure life there and bioastronautics becomes important what happens to the human being migrating between the bodies these are all things to be studied i will come from the celestial body to the earth which is at the bottom engagement with the people with the society for the well being we have the sustainable development goals 2030 well laid out for the whole world together and there are 17 basic objectives to that and if you look at most of them require space and that is where communication satellites remote sensing satellites or navigation satellites will play are playing a role there. now this based on what we did in the last several decades but 
currently with the new technology we are talking about intelligent actionable products data analytics these are all bringing now the products usable by the people the fourth dimension talks about strategic space for surveillance for missile for supremacy these are all the areas space is a high tech area space is a high risk area especially when we talk about launch vehicles or satellites the difference between a successful mission and a failed mission it's very very thin so that is another aspect to be taken into account but there is a large scope for economic impact for social impact using the space systems which we see whenever a cyclone passes through the indian coast how the satellite systems along with the rest of the systems in the chain like imd are helping the country to save lives so these are all the kinds of impacts that we have made i will stop at this point and then probably we can take a few questions or we can have discussion uh thank you uh, dr radha krishnan uh this is quite a uh, explanation of uh, you know right from the beginning what has been happening uh, possibly after the second world war though the germans first started sending rockets uh, up in the sky uh, after mr goder but uh, one question that i i'm sure uh, all of us would like to have the answer to is how do does isro manage to keep cost so low you know the uh, joke was that uh, it cost isro less money to send a man uh, to send the mangalyaan uh, to mars than it took hollywood to make the movie uh, the martian i would say there are a couple of reasons some of them are techno managerial see rocket systems and satellite systems require a lot of testing on the ground the question is what is the test philosophy and how much you get from each test russia has their own way of doing large number of ground tests but we also have evolved our style of getting the maximum benefit out of each ground test and sometimes the initial flights themselves will be a test flight of the systems that is where you actually get through the space environment the atmosphere during the flight number one. number 2 there is a lot of modularity designed in our rockets and the satellite system if you look at the pslv gslv and gsl mark 3 you will see a solid stage s139 in pslv and in gslv common system no extra development we augmented that and made a s200 for the gsl mark 3 if you look at all the liquid stages that is in pslv or in gslv or in gslv mar 3 it is based on a vigas engine the engine is common except that in gslv mar 3 we work it for longer period of time so we don't reinvent we don't redo we cut down the development time and cost accordingly if you look at the avionics it is modular all the three launch vehicles have the same system which can be produced standardized and then we reduce the time and have the pedigree and in space systems pedigree reliability are very important the same thing happens in satellite system the satellite platform is common platform systems are common but the sensors the payloads may change accordingly so dc dc converter can be produced the bus management unit can be produced so this is what we have done one more thing that is our way of working it is a devoted service we don't mind working for 18 hours a day but there are countries where working for more than 36 hours in a week is not permitted and there it is a contract and last point i saw in europe when the satellite life was exceeding its design it was designed for 5 years they found it can work for another one year they went to the government for approval to operate it for one more year because they have to pay salary for a few people to run it in isro we plan for 5 years it works for 10 years mars mission for example we thought it will work for 6 months only 
you were going in the first time. But now six years, it is there actually. So it's a way of working. It's a devotion, dedication for the country. That makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, I'll use, the, you know, that's a very, uh, uh, the answer, uh, what I like about devotion to the country. Uh, the next question that I had was, you know, uh, how are you, there's so much of brain drain uh, from our country and you're working in a, a cutting edge, at the cutting edge of technology. How do you manage to keep your people? Where do ISRO's people come from? Uh, are they from IITs and uh, NITs or uh, uh, how do you develop people? Because I think that would be a very good question for uh, I mean, uh, we'd like to have your answer for all the managers who are here, especially the HR managers. Yeah, we went through a phase. I will just take a couple of minutes. In the 60s, Tumba in Trivandrum and Trombe, they were the destinations for the best from the institutes, IATs, etc., etc. 70s, 10 was the same. But in the 80s, we found they had more opportunities and people from the local states used to come around each center. But in the 90s, when the IT boom came, we had a problem because people with five, six years experience were going out. And then we started a common induction program after recruitment. It was nice, they were with us, went through the training for four months, but when one person goes, a chain will follow him. This was the problem. So what we did, three things took place somewhere in 2000 plus. Chandrayaan came. There was talk about the human space flight. There was talk about the interplanetary missions. So the kick from those kind of high technology challenging work was the first motivator for the people. The second one was the remuneration also was enhanced by the government through different performance-based in, uh, incentives. Up to 40% one can get, and which is not permanent. He has to prove for getting that. And the third one was the kind of uh, respect that the society gave for the ISRO people made a lot of difference. I will say one thing. I was working with space, but only when Chandrayaan went up, people in my hometown recognized me. <laughs> and that's important in the society. So all these three factors went together. Same thing happened. Now you asked where from they are coming. Today, we have an institute in Trivandrum, which is having undergraduate course, postgraduate course, and doctorates. Undergraduates, we take almost 50% of our need is from there. Violence, they come from all over the country. We have a recruitment system. They come from IATs. They come from other places, et cetera. So today, we have bright, young talents. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Sudhir. Unfortunately, I don't have his last name. Uh, he wants to know uh, whether you could throw some light on China's capability in this area. See, broadly, if you take uh, the six players which I mentioned, they are in all space portfolios, launch vehicle, satellites for communication, satellite for remote sensing and navigation, and on applications, human space flight too. And if you look at the human space flight, China has gone far ahead. From the 60s, they had a focused action in the human space flight, whereas US was going up and down in this area. So that is one of their strength. If you look at the remote sensing satellites, communication satellites, or even the uh, navigation satellites, we are all there together. On launch vehicles today, the scenario is the following. We have GSLA Mar 3, which can put about 12 tons into a low Earth orbit. And low Earth orbit I will use as a benchmark. If you look at the Ariane space of Euro, they have about 20 to 25 ton capability. The Elon Musk Falcon Heavy is about 65 tons. China has a proven vehicle for about five to six tons, which is working on. And they have been working for the next level of capacity that is uh, 10 ton into geostationary orbit, which will be in the range of about 40 to 50. So in launch vehicle, they are advanced, no doubt about it. In the human space flight, they are advanced. 
But in the interplanetary missions, yes, they have a long way to go. Lunar mission, they had success. But in Mars, they did not. They went on a piggyback with Russia and that failed in the early stage itself. So they have not gone there. But if you look at the resources that they are putting, it is far more than what India is putting. And all the people say that we don't know exactly how much they are putting because all may not be disclosed. But they have a very active, strong space program, no doubt. Thank you. Uh, there are a few questions relating to Indian industry and MSME, so I'll take them together. Uh, Mr. Bharat uh, Watlu says, uh, which areas in space would uh, ISRO like the Indian private sector to be involved so that there is beneficial synergy uh, between ISRO and private entities? Uh, Mr. Rajiv Mandal has a question, which is, what is Indian industry, including MSMEs, contribution towards the success story of ISRO? In fact, in 1976, Professor Sadish Thawan made this as an internal policy that we will not invest anywhere where industry can do that work. That was a dictum to everyone. So we did not enhance our facilities. So we went to the industry from the SL major ones, like Larson and Tubro, like Walter Nagar, like HAL, on one side for fabrication. For the raw material, we went to Midhani, Bharat, Forge, etc., etc. There are people of that class. There were also many who were working on the liquid engine, for example, Godrej and MTAR. MTAR is in Hyderabad. So they were all partners from the beginning. From 70s, they have been working with us and they were learning. And when I said this number 125, they were part of this Mars space program. In fact, our honorable prime minister announced 125 firms have contributed and Mars is a pan-Indian project. So this is the contribution. But what has happened is earlier, they were only make jobbing partners, making a hardware based on the design provided by ISRO. But slowly they enhanced the value chain. They started getting into testing area. This has happened. In electronics, starting from the component procurement, making the system and testing and delivering, they evolved. The next phase was they got into integration of the satellites. The navigation satellites, which we produced in a few numbers, they had the participation of the industry to integrate. The launch vehicles, they come to Sri Harikota, they integrate. So they came to the next level. For the last seven, eight years, you have been thinking how this value chain can be enhanced and they could become risk sharing partners with us in making operational launch vehicles. And operational satellites. So this is the move in which ISRO has been working over the last years. What could be that kind of an entity? In US, you have got different systems like Boeing and Lockheed are in making uh, deliveries. In Europe, there is Ariane space. So there is a large scope for them to get into hardware systems for launch vehicles and satellites and even make the whole system, whole system. Number two, the ground equipment required for the application also in the early days, making technology and the transferring. Now they themselves get it. So this is another area. But most importantly, downstream applications, how they can have new applications. This is a large area of activity which they can certainly get into and they should get into this area. And we don't make a distinction. We never made a distinction that it is It is national industry. They have been our partners. Uh, I have a question from um, Colonel Vilas uh, Gulati. He says, uh, how do ISRO and DOS differ in their role? I don't know what DOS is, but I'm reading this question. See, in uh, one of the slides, I made a statement. ISRO, DOS, and Space Commission. In governmental system, 
the Atomic Energy Commission was a model for a major scientific high-tech activity, which is of a strategic nature. ISRO took birth in that administrative system in the physical research laboratories. In 19 policy making body, it has the Secretary Department of Space as the chairman and a few senior scientists of the country and a few senior administrators of the country, like cabinet secretary, principal secretary, national security advisor, etc. They bring to the table all their wisdom and uh, uh, the perceptions to develop the policy. The Department of Space, like any other administrative department, ensures the policy executing wing of this group. And these three, by design, have been interleaved. And they work together. And we generally call ISRO slash DOS. The Joint Secretary, Additional Secretary of the Department of Space, they also sit in the ISRO Council, which makes major decisions for the ISRO as an organization. And the chairman ISRO, the chairman ISRO Council is Secretary DOS. It's a issue. And the chairman Space Commission is the same person. So this work, I would say the accelerator, the clutch, and the brake are in the same hand, but don't mix up the roles. So basically, to ensure that there's great coordination while uh, we uh, try to uh, achieve our goals. Uh, Mr. Deepak Premnarayan says, uh, is there concern that uh, ISRO and private sector will compete in the future? I don't think it will happen. It will be a complementary role because we have a heritage from the 70s where we have been working with the user system on one side and with the industry on the other side. So this mutual respect, working together for the same goal, same goal is how space can be used for the nation. That has worked. So we sometimes we become catalyst. Sometimes we become a facilitator. That is the role that we will take. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ajayan Kavungal Anath, he says, is SpaceX going to be a game changer in space technology? And how far are they ahead in technology? In fact, the SpaceX and uh, the Blue Origin, they are all the game changers for this new space age. While you have got major space players like Boeing or Lockheed Martin, etc., on one side who have been working there for years, space has been one of their portfolios. Maybe 20, 30% of the turnover comes from space because bottom line is important. They work for aircraft industry. They work for defense industry. But here there are two people who have put their own money and they made systems which are pushing the borders of space. And today, if you take the whole world, Falcon Heavy is the one which has the maximum capability of putting about 65 tons into low Earth orbit. The space launch system, which NASA is at the moment working on, may enhance it to 130, but today SpaceX is the one. If you look at the various activities that he has done subsequently, going to the International Space Station, it is a game changer. And one more thing, in 1950s, 1960s, the competition was between US and Soviets. Today, the competition is between SpaceX and Blue Origin. That's the paradigm change. Yeah. <laughs> So there is a, another question which I might be able to answer because he wants to know whether there's any industry uh, of like Tesla in the US, which is coming into the space center. Actually, Elon Musk also uh, is, is in the space sector through his uh, company. Um, the next question is uh, from Mr. Sony, uh, sorry, CS Sony CL of uh, Thirusur. 
uh, he says whether privatization of space activities will increase the cost of information to farmers or agriculturists or whether that will augment the capability of isro see what happens is when you talk about the information from the remote sensing earth observation satellites world over the general philosophy is that information for the human meteorology etc are free and exchanged between the various nations if you have to study the cyclone in bay of bengal you require data from other places so they are available where the business is in this activity is the higher resolution satellite data like 1 meter or 0.5 meter which are required for the infrastructure planning or intelligent actionable products etc etc there yes what you say has a point but i want to flag here nasa started looking at the remote sensing satellites commercialization and they finally came to the conclusion that remote sensing data is for the public good so except for the high resolution satellites which are of this order we don't see a business option there now the point is government always provides some kind of subsidies in the system this also happens when it is for the public good so one has to work out how it is going to evolve in this area when it comes to con- communication it is totally different it is just changing the system with a cost effective option thank you um, mr pratyush murarka wants to know i mean you've said a lot about the dragon spaceship but uh, do you see a future where india could team up with non indian companies like spacex see as i said there is a global space exploration strategy today philosophically when we are looking at moon or mars and having habitat there humanity is one the geographical political boundaries should not matter each one could contribute based on the strength that we have so if india has to be a major player with a voice in this we must have our own niche area of strength then we can team up with them today in mars exploration yes we are there in moon we are there actually so human space exploration is the next one gaganyan certainly should put us into that club where we can say that yes this part we have strength we will do it and one more thing if you look at the joint uh, mission that we are going to have for the remote sensing activity with nasa it is because of the that strength we are making a payload they are making a another payload putting in a satellite which is made by us launched by us this happens so we will have a major role and no country can do it alone and there is no player right go there collectively okay um the next question is from mr lalit khanna and maybe this is confidential so you need not answer it but he wants to know whether there is any telecommunication company asking isro to expand the satellite of its own or extend i mean give it bandwidth to give it bandwidth i don't know now what happens is we have the communication satellite systems and we started with insat in the 80s and initially satellites were there and the users had to be convinced that satellite is a good medium but today we are in a situation where demand is going up new technologies are coming in so this is a dynamic situation of demand supply with the current technology this happens always the specifics i won't be answering uh, uh this is a question which uh, is very interesting and this is uh, i think human beings have always wondered about this uh, what are your thoughts on existence of life in outer space Uh, or another planet i mean every so few weeks we hear about exoplanets new exoplanets which can support life uh, being discovered which are in that uh, 
magic, uh, you know, where, where life can uh, survive uh, in that uh, space around the star. So what are your thoughts on uh, existence of life in space? My thoughts are like what anyone of you must be having. It is said in the solar system, Earth is uniquely placed to have this life sustenance. The origin of life it started 4 billion years ago in a specific condition which you are not able to exactly uh, duplicate, replicate. Now, there is another theory saying that life is all everywhere and the mighty will come up. That is a, one theory, but that is one part of it. People are looking at it, so planet looking at the possibilities of this environment in which life can sustain. And you have to define what that life is, life as we know, or life in some other form, or whether it is intelligent life. So this is one area where scientists are likely to work in the future. In the first one, exploration where there is life anywhere. So exoplanet is one such possible source of finding some kind of evidence in the future. It is a subject of study. Okay, <laughs> open question. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Ajayan again uh, has asked a question. He says, uh, how far is ISRO uh, ahead in joining hands with startups? And is there a policy uh, in place for how ISRO will uh, connect with uh, private sector enterprise or startups? See, the question is about the startups. It is not about the space industry, which is going to work with ISRO to be part of their missions. Uh, Dr. Shivan, Chairman Isro, recently also mentioned about the space act, which is in the final stages. In fact, a draft was put up on the web in 2017, and people are working on that, which is essential because as per the international treaties, there are responsibilities for the state. State means the nation on many of the activities which are going to be performed in outer space, etc., how they are going to work on that. This is something which has to come. But the basic intention of this restructuring, as we all understand, is to inspire, to enable those startups to do major things in the future. More people in the model of Tesla or uh, the Bezos, etc., at various scales could come up. And there has to be two things. One is the uh, conducive legal framework regulation is whatever is required and capacity building. It's a high tech area. It is part of ISRO was a startup in the 1960s with fresh people and it came up. So there is enough opportunity and we should expect it to happen. Another 10 years time, we should see several of them in various cutting edge areas of activity contributing. Okay, while we are on startups, uh, what kind of uh, Mr. NR, I don't know what his full name is, but he wants to know what kind of gestation period uh, can be expected for Indian startups venturing into space technology, given that uh, the domain of space technology is run through a heritage of subsystems and components. How far do you think it is practical for Indian startups uh, contributing meaningfully towards the space system yeah, there are four areas. One Part is space and ISRO. One is space application, space-based services, intelligent, actionable products. It is a question of a few months if a good team comes up with a bright idea, they can get in. With all these satellite systems. When you're talking about ground equipment required for using the space systems. It is electronic technology machine, which is certainly When you talk about satellites, I just want to say in this country, the students from engineering got our own PSL vehicle. Some of them, they developed systems. In some of them, they had the end-to-end -end satellite to the ground segment readiness. So it is possible in a, a couple of years for people to get geared up for doing this kind of an activity. When it comes to launch vehicle, it is far more complex. 
The reason is it is a guarded technology. You have to develop from scratch, from the textbook knowledge, most of the things that are required for a launch vehicle or a rocket. And it is rocket science. Uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan. So there it will be slightly more difficult. But uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, uh, we are losing you in between. Could you uh, switch off your video for some time? Because I think the bandwidth over there is uh, low. So there are some messages also coming on the chat that the bandwidth is low. So we're losing you halfway in between. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I will just uh, summarize what I said. When it comes to the new novel applications using space systems, it's a question of months if a good team teams up, they can do it. When it comes to the ground equipment, where there is a very good market, especially for the new systems, they can do it, and this requires essentially collaboration with other countries because basically many other components may not be available. You don't know how to reduce, etc. When it comes to satellites, yes, it can be done, especially for the small satellites. There will be a good opportunity, and small satellites is the order of the day. When it comes to launch vehicle, it's a guarded technology. One has to start from textbook, and it's a long lead item. But if you look at the market. 70% is for the ground equipment and services. That is where one should actually pitch in and work on. So where the turnover is large, the gestation period also is small, and that is probably the right place for them to get in first. Okay. Uh, there is one more uh, question. Uh, how can space technology be utilized uh, for monitoring India's very long border areas from enemy intrusion. Uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, this Mr. Uh, Arun Kumar Agarwal would like to have your specific comment, please. See, we have remote sensing satellites which can look at any part of the earth. There are high resolution satellites. There are satellites which can see through the clouds. There are satellites which have the day, night, observation capability. They can look at our fields or they can look at any other fields. One has to judge also from the data plus the other information, what information we can get out of it. This is happening everywhere. All around the world, this is happening. That's the, one of the important elements of the space for the large security purposes, surveillance. Uh, Mr. P. V. G. Menon, former president of Indian Electronics and Semiconductor Association, he has a question. Uh, he says, since India's attempts to get a private sector semiconductor fab, fab uh, has not been successful, can part of SCL capacity be made available for private sector? Provide, uh, perhaps Anatrix Corporation can handle the commercial aspects since SCL is a government department. This is an answer, best answer with the chairman is through. But what I can say is the following. As far as electronics devices are concerned, our country is far behind anyone in the world. We are not even in the list of first 50. And what ISRO did was in the year 2005, 2006, we acquired this semiconductor limited from electronics. We invested there, we produced chips, which are flying in the PSLV, GSLV, and GSLV Mark III. So we have shown in this country that we can do it. Now, as he said, there were two major proposals which have been going for the last 10 years, and they have not fructified. The efforts are again on to have a kind of program. There is an empowered committee which is looking into this aspect. I'm also part of that committee. We are active on that. This is a requirement for the country. And without electronic devices being here, without a design coming from India, we will not be able to be self-reliant in this area. Okay. 
there's also a concern expressed that although there may be a technologically better product, which may be more reliable, better priced, will there be a level playing field by government departments? For? Uh, for products made for the space sector, I guess. See, in space sector, whether it is from anywhere, the reliability matters, the pedigree matters, the quality matters. Even today, all those industries who are supplying systems to ISRO go through the stringent quality requirements, rejections are high. They may lose initially through this stringent quality process which they have to follow, but they gain in a longer term because the quality culture of their industry goes up actually. We cannot accept anything that doesn't pass through the sieve of quality and the testing process. Okay. Uh, as Priya Darshi wants to know, when can we complete an Indian GPS system? It is not G, it is R. It is the regional system that we have today, the NAVIC, which has a coverage of Indian Ocean region. As compared to the global systems like uh, GPS or Galileo or GLONASS, this is for the regional application. We have a constellation of seven satellite systems and the ground systems are getting ready for that purpose. The idea is we will have an assured signal even in difficult times. Uh, Mr. Rajiv Mandal wants to know, how did private entities like SpaceX move so fast? Uh, did NASA or any other agencies help them grow? Or were they able to attract people from NASA and other agencies? What I understand is, yes, they have been able to get. In fact, in US, there was a policy that they will go for commercial space. And their target is activities in the lower orbit should be left to the commercial sector, including the International Space Station operation, which they are discussing at the moment. And I have heard that SpaceX has also been flying on the wings of NASA. They have benefited, but they have benefited after standing on their leg. They have almost uh, 4,000 specialists working in their area to develop their launch systems, et cetera, et cetera. So with the basic capability, they have also got benefited from the NASA system. So whatever they put up, whether it's SpaceX or uh, other companies like that, will that obviously will be able to operate over Indian skies as well? See, when it comes to any remote sensing satellite, they all operate all over the globe. And there's an open sky policy, they can acquire data, they can record it and download when it comes to their area. All of us to be touched. And there are no great re regulation, except that you should not infringe into the uh, secrecy of other countries. That's all what happens. So that is possible. As far as communication satellites are concerned, it is basically the beam design, the footprint, we should not infringe into other areas. It is controlled by the International Telecommunication Union. There are regulations for that. You have to shape your antenna pattern, footprint accordingly. This happens. For remote sensing, it is general. No issue. Okay. Uh, so we are coming towards 7.30. So the last, I think this is the last question and I'll leave it to you because it's an open-ended question. Uh, how long you want to answer this. Uh, this is from Dr. Sanjay Bahal. Uh, what are the future projects of ISRO in the next decade? See, immediate activity which uh, all of us talk about is the human space flight. Because this is one portfolio, ISRO is not there. And all our leading partners, they have say in that. Now, we started this activity in 2006 with a study. We started working on the critical technologies. We had some experiments, and now there is a full-fledged program. And Gaganyan is the next level for us, and it is going to make a change for the whole country. If you look at the space exploration, looking at moon, 
with the lander that we tried we didn't succeed it is going to happen soon mars what is the next step in mars this isro is working out along with other countries what more scientific work we can do in that area aditya mission looking at the sun from an orbit which is just 1.5 kilometers from earth an orbit in between sun and earth this has been going on and it will happen soon the aditya mission on space exploration now when it comes to the satellite systems our target is we have to be now up to date the technology is changing fast high power satellites high frequency satellites high throughput satellites for communication on one side and the electronic electric propulsion this, these are all some of the technologies for the satellite system in launch vehicle yes we are working on a semi cryogenic uh, stage which will enhance the current capability of the launch vehicle of gsle mar 3 to at least 20 25% this is going to happen so so these are all some of the immediate plans so thank you because i think uh, you said immediate and immediate looks like it's uh, 10 years looking 10 years ahead because all the space programs actually do uh, go on for a long time i uh, know uh, those two uh, spacecraft uh, which were sent when i was in college i believe uh, voyager 1 and voyager 2 uh, which have uh, which were the first uh, bodies uh, human made satellites Uh, that uh, is, have gone beyond the solar system, and so one needs to look at a very different time scale. This time scale, when one is uh, working with space, and uh, you know, Rekha, it's seven thirty, so I shall uh, wrap this up. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, uh, for being here with us uh, this evening. Uh, there's there's been a large number of questions just coming through, and I'm sorry, but I could take only a few of them. but to me uh, that sh- they showed uh, how much pride all of us have uh, in the program that uh, you have been part of you have run and i'm sure that uh, you continue to guide uh, even now and uh, i believe uh, you have the best wishes of i mean i'm sure you have the best wishes of over 1.4 billion indians uh, we want india to be there uh, right up there you you've said that there are i think about six countries above us but whatever it takes you i think if you tell all of us that we want to move to number 6 or number 5 or number 4 and help us and this is what we need i'm sure uh, everyone over here and everyone who is not here this evening will want to contribute to ensure that our nation is also there as one of the top 2 or top 1 or top 3 uh, in the very near future so once again thank you so much uh, for being with us this evening thank you it was a privilege thank you Rekha? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Radhakrishnan. It's been a matter of pride for Ima to have you here with us today, and Mr. Kiloska summed it up so well that I think all of us on this uh, call have a lot to be proud about uh, about the way our space program is done and handled. And uh, I hope we have many more such sessions with you. As he rightly said, that there were many more questions than we, you know, you could answer. They were. over a thousand people on our other channels of youtube twitter and facebook so unfortunately we could not take those questions here but thanks a lot and i hope uh, you will do us the honor of joining us once again uh, in the near future for another talk on what's happening in the space thank, thank you thank you thank you with these words good night everybody and look forward to seeing you next week for the next leader speak session with mr shamsaran former foreign secretary uh, government of india on the 16th of july good night